I, for some reason, chose a harder topic for myself. I thought I would give you more of a technical approach of the two things that are now quite popular, but perhaps underutilized by primary care doctors, as well as gastroenterologists. One of them is called, well, what I'm going to talk about today is the role of high-resolution esophageal manometry and how, that may how your practice may benefit from it. There's two types of esophageal manometry. We do tend to put it all together, but basically it's esophageal motility study that will measure the pressures of the esophagus and help you differentiate patients who may have dysphagia or non-cardiac chest pain. And then there's a 24-hour pH study which measures how much acid is actually produced in the stomach and therefore causing some of the reflux symptoms that may affect you. So one of the topics that I'll mention is the cost utility and limitations of, the, of, of these tests, how to order the tests, whether patients should be on medications or off medications when you order the test, and whether that the management of gastroesophageal reflux disease is really effective. Think of these tests as for patients who come in complaining of symptoms of heartburn, complaining of symptoms of regurgitation, or maybe even atypical symptoms that Dr. Albertson mentioned, non, uh, uh, the extraesophageal manifestations, be it laryngitis, cough, um, or non-cardiac chest pain. What happens is if some of you do the trial of PPI therapy and then send them for endoscopy, and all the complications that Dr. Albertson has showed you, including strictures, esophagitis, uh, webs, rings, whatever you may find, if somebody has already been treated with PPI, you may have a nerd on your hands. And a nerd is not necessarily a medical student, but a non-esophageal reflux disease. So then you're stuck looking at a patient going, well, the doctor didn't find anything, so what do you do next? The interesting part about the high resolution manometry is that it has changed in the last few years and now we're able to find more, more data and how to, how to help your patients. So again, GERD is a, uh, according to the Montreal consensus is a condition that develops when the reflux of the stomach uh, contents, the, the acid itself causes the troublesome symptoms and or complications. The endoscopy of course will be able to document the evidence of the injury, be it a sinophilic esophagitis, bare stri or stricture. But again, if it's negative, but patients are still have troublesome symptoms, we do call it non-erosive uh, reflux disease. So how do you measure the movement of that refluxate into the esophagus? And the most important thing to remember is that we do have a hint. The pH of the stomach is significantly lower than the pH of the esophagus. So if the pH of esophagus runs around 7, the pH of the stomach acid content is around 4, we're able to measure how much acid truly is moving up and causing symptoms. Remember, a lot of you have physiological reflux, and we're eating this amazing meal. Some of you may get chocolate for dessert. I don't know if we're offering that, but I thought I'd entice you. Um, you're drinking some wine. So there's physiological reflux that occurs within the next 30 minutes. Now, whether that acid is causing you symptoms, that's the debatable uh, point. All right. So according to the AGA uh, statement position, the most important part and the reason I included it is that a lot of you may have ordered a 24-hour pH study. If I can have a show of hands of how many of you have actually either are familiar with the test, have ordered the uh, manometry test to evaluate the acid? Perfect. None of you. All right. Not Dr. M Joel? Robin? Okay. At least, at least three of you in this room have. Perfect. All right. So the grade B recommendation basically says that there's actually fair evidence that it improves important outcomes. So of course the first thing you're going to do on your patient is after you've decided to either give them a trial of PPI or refer them to a gastroenterologist, you're going to document whether they have any complications. And of course if they have alarm signs or symptoms, as Dr. Alberson mentioned, uh, such as dysphagia, weight loss, any bleeding, they're going to get that endoscopy. But what's the second thing that you do? And so what has been shown is that manometry used to evaluate patients with suspected esophageal GERD symptoms who have not responded to the empirical trial of twice daily PPI therapy or have normal endoscopy, this is actually, show, uh, manometry has been shown to um, improve outcomes. It will help to localize lower esophageal sphincter for potential pH studying. So the two tests are actually work great together. And we'll look at the peristaltic function as well as if you do consider ordering any preoperative tests, for example, Neeson fund application, then this is an excellent test as well. So why is everyone so excited about the new esophageal motility study? Well, I'll tell you that all the GI doctors, at least who've been doing esophageal motility 
uh, since fellowship, like I have, are extremely excited. We used to look at, we at all of these waveforms, and it was that course and, and fellowship that you wanted to avoid. Anything but esophageal motility. It was very time consuming and very prone to interpretation. So you could have said, I think this is that, and your boss came in and said, no, you're completely wrong. So you had a 50-50 you know, chance of being right. Well, now Ray Klaus, back in 1990s, introduced this new high-resolution manometry. And the beauty of this is that you, clearly I'm excited about this, you get a catheter that is now able to evaluate the entire esophagus from pharynx to stomach. We have 36 circumferential pressure sensors that are spaced one centimeter apart. I can tell you everything that's going on from your swallow. So when I tell my patients that I can evaluate their esophagus because they're having difficulty swallowing or they're having gastroesophageal reflux disease, we used to say, well, I can do an endoscopy. I can tell you there are ulcerations. I can tell you there's an obstruction. I can tell you if I can dilate you. I can do a barium swallow. Many of you have probably ordered that. And I can tell you what's going on in the esophagus. But now I can tell your patients that I can tell you exactly how the pressures are working. I can tell you if every time you swallow and you're having symptoms, I can tell you what's going on. So this is a phenomenal system. So not only does it, again, with pharynx to stomach, but also these pressure points, he converted it into a top topographical color plot. So based on the colors, red being the higher pressures, blue being lower pressures. So this is, we have landmarks. So this is being upper esophageal sphincter. It opens up when you're trying to swallow, and then will close up immediately once the food is moving into the esophagus. This is your striated muscle. This is a transition zone between the striated muscle and the smooth muscle, so extremely beneficial for your rheumatologist or patients who have uh, connective tissue disorders. If they're having difficulty swallowing, we can definitely pick up uh, all of that. Then, of course, this is the lower esophageal sphincter which if we're looking for transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations, one of the causes of gastroesophageal reflux disease, this is a great study. So again, the main landmarks that we can now easily see, and not only us, but the nurse who's doing the study, she can easily assess the upper esophageal sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter, the transitional zone, and of course the, uh, the peristalsis or lack of. So upper esophageal sphincter, a very easy to see relaxation, the pressures drop, very easy to see the transitional zone, and with new, uh, we call them Chicago classifications, a uh, group uh, from Pandolfino in Chicago came up with it. We can now even tell if patients are having breaks um, or defects in that transition zone, and that again helps us to determine whether you, we're trying to find out what, what is accounting for all the symptoms that your patients have. So before we call them the fibromyalgia or IBS of, uh, of our world, of the gastroesophageal reflux world, we, do, we are obtaining enough data to help your patients out. All right, this is a complete lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, and as you can see, this is the impaired lower esophageal sphincters. See how the line is continuous with no breaks? So now we can even determine more. And this is what I was trained on, so you can tell this was completely not exciting and so much easier. All right, the technical aspect, it is now an extremely easy procedure. So if it's extremely easy for me to interpret, it is, it's easier for your patient to tolerate. A nurse will administer 10 swallows, and in our center in Westwood, Dr. Conklin, who we're very excited because he just left Cedars to come join us at UCLA, he actually does additional studies. So if patient says, you know what, I have no problem swallowing, but sometimes honey or peanut butter, that's what gets stuck and the barium didn't show anything or even a video swallow, we can now do in addition to the wet swallows, we can do viscous or whatever food they, they've complained about, we can now monitor that closely. Again, color based, so we can tell what are the pressures. If somebody has nutcracker esophagus, those are the higher pressures Greater, it used to be greater than 180 millimeters of mercury. Now the classifications changed to 220. But based on those pressures, we can say, all right, you're not having cardiac chest pain. Stop seeing your cardiologist. We can now examine that as a nutcracker esophagus or diffuse esophageal spasms, not to steal business from the two cardiologists here. And we do have a set of normal values that have been published and validated that, again, is new. So the data has been validated. How do you validate it? Of course, we, we do rely on both endoscopy and a barium swallow to validate it. This is a study in, Amer uh, in the Journal of American College of Surgery a couple of years ago. But they took 50 healthy patients and 106 patients who actually had symptoms. And they were looking for something very specific. They were looking for defective lower esophageal sphincter on the high resolution manometry. Basically, that sphincter on the lower part that I showed you, that sphincter wasn't relaxed or there was an associated hiatal hernia. And they were able to confirm an 86% of patients did have hiatal hernia if there was a defective lower esophageal sphincter. And as you can assume, if somebody does have a, a defect in that sphincter, the acid that's made in the stomach will be able to cause um, complications 
such as Barrett's esophagus or Rofus of esophagitis, and therefore patients would have a positive pH study. Same thing with hiatal hernia. Almost 91% had confirmation on endoscopy and 81% with barium swallow. Nothing is 100%, but those are really significant numbers for us. All right, so is this the new standard? We do think that the high resolution manometry is actually one of the better studies compared to the waveform. And the reason we think that is that the yield, uh, especially for studies like dysphagia, the diagnostic yield has increased by almost 20%. It is a great tool to identify transient lower esophageal sphincters. When patients are not swallowing, you're still seeing gaps in that lower line. Uh, bolus transit, we're able to follow that. It is more reproducible. This is a great study by Grubel who basically said even medical students are getting the same results as fellows. So that's pretty good. Normal values, of course, have been established so we can uh, do a proper test. And then important pathology, which is what I'm going to mention in just a couple of slides. We now have completely different treatment of achalasia because of that. And the technical imperfections where uh, a catheter may coil up or there's air in the sheath, those still occur, but again, significantly less than before. So achalasia, most of you are familiar with. If you uh, took internal medicine boards, there's <coughs> always one or two questions on that. But the main thing that you need to know about achalasia is that there's impaired G-junction relaxation and there's a lack of peristalsis. So we used to call that classical achalasia. And the typical presentation on, um, on the barium swallow was this bird's beak. There's this narrowing. And the patients, patients would come in presenting with either dysphagia or chest pain. And when an endoscopist would put camera in, we would see a lot of food remain, remaining in the esophagus that wasn't going down. So the patients would be scheduled for either Botox, pneumatic dilation, or helomyotomy, and of course, calcium channel blockers. Now the pathogenesis is due to impa impaired uh, non-cholinergic, non-adrenergic inhi inhibitory input. Nitric oxide is the one that's implicated in the physiological inhibition of relaxation. So we used to call it classical achalasia if we saw all lack of peristalsis. And then we used to call this term a vigorous achalasia because we didn't really know what was going on, but the pressures were extremely high in the esophagus and patients had the same symptoms, but manometrically we could not call it classical achalasia because there was actually really high pressures, and I'll show you pictures in just a little bit. Well, three years ago, again, Pandolfino is one of our godfathers of um, esophageal motility. He actually published a paper based on the new high-resolution motility. We've been calling achalasia incorrectly. So there's now three types of achalasia, not just one. And look how different they look. So this is the classical type. There's absolutely lack of peristalsis. But type 2 and 3 that we kept calling vigorous achalasia are actually two separate types of achalasia and respond differently <coughs> to therapy. Why do we care? Because patients that you were referring to surgery or Botox may not respond as well unless you know manometrically what's going on. So clinically, as you can see, they look completely different. And this is the simultaneous swallow. They always show you this, this picture on the boards. All right. So the classical type of achalasia was more prominent in, uh, in females. Patients were presenting with dysphagia rather than chest pain. And when I put down more mean number of dilatation, that just meant that per nine month uh, study that they did, patients had between, well, about mean of 1.6 times that they got dilated. But these patients actually had a better response to helomyotomy. So let's save our patients some time and money, and especially comfort. When somebody comes in, you diagnose them with difficulty swallowing. And I do realize achalasia is pretty rare, but uh, better response to helomyotomy, they should go straight to surgery. The lack of peristalsis, oh, excuse me, in type 2 achalasia, patients presented with dysphagia, but type 2 responded great to anything. Anything you offered these patients, they did great. Type 3, more male predominance, complained of chest pain, and this type did not respond to any therapy. So they weren't doing great with anything. These are the patients that are coming back and saying, I had that surgery, but I'm still not feeling well. So as you can tell, we can... High resolution uh, manometry is actually able to let us diagnose uh, this new type of achalasia. Briefly, non cardiac chest pain that was mentioned. Pa of course, first, first, first of all, you see your cardiologist probably a couple of times if you keep complaining of chest pain, get every workup known to mankind. But once you realize that perhaps it is not cardiac and is now esophageal, most of the patients you will refer uh, for endoscopy or a trial of PPI BID for four weeks. 
Let's say the endoscopy is negative, don't forget to order an ambulatory pH study and of course the motility study because a lot of times with pa patient symptoms and that has been documented when they're complaining of dysphagia or chest pain, again that, mo you know, 50% of them may be just experiencing gastroesophageal reflux disease or functional chest pain. So empiric treatment has been shown to, uh, to be of benefit, we could try it for four weeks prior to, you know, that's how long it will probably take them to get an endoscopy. There's no really data comparing uh, the uh, esophageal manometry to medications and the, the, those studies are pending. AGA, that's our big society, that's a great aid recommendation that if somebody has chest pain, um, you do have to test them if the chest pain persists. Uh, we f have found abnormal esophageal motility in up to almost 30% of patients who've come in with non-cardiac chest pain. Some of the things that we have found was diffuse esophageal spasm. In fact, William Osler has mentioned that back in uh, 1892, that that's the, one of his presumption. However, less than 5% of patients will have that. Hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter, that's GERD, 60% of patients who have non-cardiac chest pain may just be suffering from gastroesophageal reflux disease. Of course, the nutcracker esophagus, that's what I just mentioned, that the, press, uh, the pressures, high pressures uh, during peristalsis. And of course, uh, about 10% will have nonspecific motility disorders. All right. Now, I wanted to, um, to switch gears and go from the esophageal motility study that's mentioning the pressures to the 24-hour pH study. And the reason I went that way is because I tend to order both studies together. I think they're very complementary. The first study that we allow the patients to have the 10 swallows, we're able to find out where their lower esophageal sphincter is. So when we put the second catheter in for the 24-hour mm. evaluation of their esophageal acid, we actually know where the, sphincter sh uh, where the sphincter is and therefore where that catheter should end. <coughs> and again, it is a grade B recommendation to go ahead and proceed with ambulatory uh, impedance or catheter pH or wireless pH monitoring. That's Bravo. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. That's the wireless pH monitoring. We do know that we are able to measure the acid that your patients have between 24 hours, if you do the old transnasal catheter system, which I think is wonderful, or even a 48 to 96 hour uh, measurement of acid. All right. So some of the algorithms uh, for um, heartburn that has been shown, this is part of Medscape. Again, heartburn, no alarm symptoms. You can try the PPI, you can, no response. You, can do, you will do an endoscopy. Alarm symptoms, you go straight to endoscopy. And although they recommend ambulatory pH right away to look for symptom association for reflux, um, the GI Society actually says consider doing motility study in conjunction with the ambulatory pH to, to make sure that the esophageal peristalsis is within normal limits and you're not missing achalasia or motility no. disorder. All right. We of course are looking for best outcome measures for, uh, for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Keep in mind that at esophageal acid exposure cannot pre predict the presence of GERD. So let's say you've measured the acid. You can tell your patients based on these numbers, you're more predisposed to having Barrett's. Based on these numbers, you're more predisposed to having erosive esophagitis. We do know, um, and because there's, we do know that there's some graded increase in severity. So the higher the number is, the potential to have symptoms and complications is greater, and obviously the potential for them to have troublesome symptoms is greater, but there's a lot of overlap with asymptomatic, asymptomatic control. So the numbers for this have not been as validated as we would like them to be. But what we do know about the 24, hour, 24 or 48 hour motility studies is they can predict response to anti-reflux therapy. That's that Neeson fund duplication, or even the endoscopic therapy that we can offer. So if patients come in and now they have failed, your endo the endoscopy is negative, so you have nothing to show them or treat them for, you're still probably treating them for symptoms. You're probably still saying you're having these symptoms, you're not responding, responding to once a day Nexium or Protonics or uh, Prilosec, whatever medication you may be using. So then you probably recommend a BID therapy. Well, here's a little problem. I don't know about your insurance companies. Mine have not been reimbursing BID therapy. I've had to write letters and call, and when I do add to, to the letter that patients have had a 24-hour pH study and they have a high acid based on those numbers, that gets approved sooner rather than later. So abnormal pH score, if somebody has a lot of acid off medications, once we can tell them that, that sur they will have a better outcome with Neeson fund application or surgery. Um, this is, oh, excuse me. 
similar study, but basically saying if somebody had normal tests, so no, no acid, and the test was completely normal, they won't do as well. So before you send anyone to surgery, please get the study done. In fact, most surgeons now require it and will not perform surgery without it because no one wants to have a poor outcome of surgery. So this is a question I get all the time on our forms is, do I send the patient who's already taking Nexium, or I'll use that for, uh, as a PPI, and the patient does, you know, is scheduled for your study and they don't want to take the medication, what happens? Because now they're finally symptom free, or maybe they're not and they're scared to feel even worse. We do recommend for patients to be off therapy. I think you get most information, but keep in mind you can answer separate questions with off and on therapy. If somebody is off therapy, they should be off for, se uh, for seven days of PPIs, three days off H2 blockers, and if they're using an over-the-counter over, uh, counter antacids, uh, at le again, at least 72 hours would be great. So patients who do not fully respond to PPI therapy and don't have a diagnosis of GERD on endoscopy, again, anyone pre-surgery or persistent uh, symptoms after surgery, anything to rule out GERD, Patients may have functional or non-acid reflux. This is a great study. They're not taking any medications. You can tell the patient, you know what? I realize you're having symptoms, but this study, when you're not being treated, did not show that there's acid, not physiological acid, but now pathological uh, reflux is not existent. And of course, the, the yield of symptom index and symptom association probability, which I'll mention in a second, is greater if you're off therapy. But let's be honest, sometimes the patients tell you how to treat them and they will say, well, I'm on therapy and figure it out because I can't get off therapy. So what we do know is that although there's no established threshold, we do use a number of 1.6, so that's a number for, for GI doctors if you've used it. We do have a, a, a way to sort of figure out what the pH should be, how much time you should spend in that. So if the pH is less than 4, if somebody was off meds, we use a, a number that's been calculated as 4%. On meds, we expect that number to be less than 1.6. It does help determine, for example, for some of your patients that they're on once a day therapy and they're still having breakthrough acid, they may be a great candidate for BID therapy or twice a day. Um, to assess potential role of non-acid reflux. So you can tell a patient, listen, you're on twice a day therapy. The number of refluxes should be the same, just the acid that has been decreased. So you can use that uh, as a possibility, especially if you use in conjunction with uh, impedance study. <coughs> Again, look at the pretest probability. If your patients are complaining of the most common symptoms, regurgitation and heartburn, you might get a better answer than the chest pain or extra esophageal symptoms. If somebody's on a BID therapy, the numbers have actually shown that very low li uh, likelihood of having a positive test. So if somebody is already on a BID therapy, I tell them that most likely the test will be negative. Let's try to figure out why are you on BID therapy? What else can we offer you? So just a couple of words about the technical aspect of this test. Not the, um, it's not the easiest test. So there's two ways to do this test. One is the transnasal approach. We put a sensor, a catheter inside their, uh, inside their nasal cavity. We put a tape on their nose and most of the patients are absolutely terrified of going out in public. <laughs> so they sit at home. So they're probably not as active and they're not going about their day. And so when they tell you that, and they, all, we ask all the patients to keep a diary. So we know exactly when they're eating, we know exactly when they're sleeping, we know what they ate, and we know when their symptoms occur. And they have a little bit, they have a box on their left or right side where they press that button. So then we can correlate that. So if, uh, not only their symptoms, but we can eliminate the time, uh, uh, the food that they've consumed. Remember I said 30 minutes after a meal, uh, that time, uh, meal elimination time is taken into account. So yeah, it's not the prettiest test, but I tell patients, you know, try to go as much about your activity as possible. Mm -hmm. We do now have Bravo test, which is basically an endoscopically placed capsule, <coughs> and that is attached to your esophagus. There's some contraindications to that. If somebody has bleeding disorders or severe esophagitis um, or pacemaker, that's probably not a great study. But the, the difference between transnasal catheter, that obviously patients can only tell, tolerate for about 24 hours, and the, uh, the Bravo capsule, is that the Bravo, the wireless pH capsule, can stay for 40, uh, 48 hours, and in some cases, even longer. <coughs> what you can do with that is you can actually try, and again, this is getting more advanced, can try patients on therapy and off therapy. You can say, okay, you're off therapy for 24 hours, and then for the next 24 hours, I can put you on therapy, and we can compare, because to tell the patients, we'll see Nexium does work whether you, or not you need 
um, twice a day medication. So Johnson and Demister, and the reason I put Demister is because I actually trained at USC. So Tom Demister was one of our surgeons. He came up with this for esophageal pH monitoring system. We actually have a score. And so when we review the 24-hour pH system, it kind of looks like this. This is the pH of 4. And then we'll look down when that number dips below 4. And then patients, you know, we mark down when they're supine. We mark down meal, the green areas, when we eliminate that. And so we monitor the patient. So it's not, we don't look at the end result, but if it, we look at pretty much the entire picture, because if the patients are saying that they have symptoms, and they have symptoms of chest pain or regurgitation, they can mark that down, and we can correlate. So things that go into the components of the uh, esophageal monitoring are the percent total time that pH is less than 4, the uh, percentage of time the patient is upright versus supine, the number of reflux episodes, long episodes less, uh, great, greater than five minutes, and of course the longest episode total. All of that is used by some really bizarre formula, I didn't even want to put that up, but the score of greater than 14.72 is what we indicate a positive test. Here's the thing though, sometimes you get a score of 13.7, and sometimes you get a score of you know 14 or 12, so a lot of it is and I'm not saying based on interpretation, but a lot of it, you're going to look at the patient's entire picture. You're going to look at how many symptoms they've had, how many symptoms are associated with reflux, and whether, uh, is the patient hypersensitive to acid? Is there a non-acid reflux? And so you're able to give a, a really complete picture by the time this exam is done. All right. The extraesophageal symptoms and response to empiric trials of acid-reducing medications are considered to be actually poor predictors of presence of gastroesophageal reflux disease. The score is more likely to identify GERD in patients who have met other empiric diagnostic criteria. And, er, and uh, Kleiman, this is one of the surgeons who just published this paper, basically said that earlier referral for a 24-hour esophageal pH monitoring may avoid those lengthy periods of unnecessary medical therapy. So are patient symptoms due to reflux? So the two most common methods that we use on that 24-hour uh, monitoring system is the symptom index and the symptom association probability. And although this gets quite complicated, the main thing to consider is, are those patients who are complaining of reflux, and when they mark that button, they say, I have chest pain, we're able to look and say, does that, did that reflux occur by chance? Just because the mercury and the sun are not lined, and you're getting that reflux, or is it consistent throughout your complaints? So if somebody has five episodes of chest pain and five out of five are associated with lower reflux once meals are excluded, most likely your patient is telling you the truth. They're symptomatic. That Demeester score may be negative. The number of refluxes may be less than 55, but if they're constantly telling you they have chest pain and we have a symptom association probability greater than 95% that it's not occurring by chance, we can tell you that as well. So then you can tell the patient, that's true, you're symptomatic, you're hypersensitive to the acid, let's figure out what else we can do. All right. So we do think it is, you know, the symptom correlation measures, be it uh, index or association probability, is recommended to statistically interpret the causality of particular symptom. The use of symptom correlation in chronic laryngeal symptoms, meaning extraesophageal symptoms, is actually uh, as yet of unproven benefit. Uh, for some patients, such as non-cardiac chest pain, it actually works great. And of course, if the more data you have, i.e. 48 hours, more than 24 hours, the more data we can, we can get. So in light of Obamacare, we do want to know, is everything cost effective? So again, this is a retrospective data in 100 patients, and patients came in with symptoms of um, anything from chest pain, dysphagia, regurgitation. And what they noticed is that 83 patients came in with esophageal symptoms. The time to refer to a 24-hour esophageal study was 208 weeks among those patients. The 17 patients who had extraesophageal symptoms, it took them 52 weeks to see a gastroenterologist and get a side. Now, not for endoscopy, for a 24-hour pH study. These patients had refractory symptoms despite long PPI use. So cumulatively, 21,411 weeks of PPI therapy beyond the recommended four to eight week trial. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of medications, right? When they noticed out of those patients, 30% actually had negative pH monitoring. 30% of patients probably did not need that PPI therapy. They might have had non-acid reflux. They might have had non-cardiac chest pain. 
assuming a 100% sensitivity test, they obviously had a, a statistician as part of the system, $7,000 per patient over 10 years was spent. Now we know that no test is 100% sensitive. I told you before some of the numbers I used are between 60 to 80%. But let's say even if we had a 35% sensitivity on that test, switching therapy, meaning doing that test, would have been cost effective. Now, keep in mind, doctors continue therapy even in the absence of normal findings because patients are saying there is a symptomatic uh, improvement. This study is actually from abroad, from Switzerland, and that was published in the journal of Scandinavian Journal of Gastro. Same thing, they took 300 patients who were referred for the first time. They noted that patients had uh, anything from GERD to connective tissue disorder. And what they noticed was the cost per testing was estimated to be 305 American dollars. To change the management, because that's what they had to do, was actually 465 dollars a patient. So combined 24-hour pH and manometry, meaning both esophageal pressures and the 24-hour study, has been shown to be useful and cost-effective. Of interest, this, the diagnosis was changed in the management in 66% of patients, altered diagnosis in 44% of patients, and, and confirmed in only 38% of patients. We have something called esophageal diagnostic working group, people who are way smarter than me, but do include Jeff Conklin, who is... Uh, um, in Westwood and does a lot of our esophageal studies. He's part of this. But they do strongly recommend documenting pathological acid. All of us have physiological acid. We want to know if there's abnormal symptoms or complications and they do recommend documenting it off PPI therapy uh, because it is an important measurement in management of GERD, especially in patients not only not responding to PPI and of course anyone scheduled for anti-reflux therapy. Just briefly, there is something called intraluminal impedance. Not every center has it. This is based on the fact that both air, fluid, and esophageal wall all have unique properties. Um, but there's a, actually a somewhat lack of data right now to, to support addition of impedance. But a lot of doctors are able to look at that and use it as a bolus transit. Somebody is having non-acid reflux. We're able to use this as a great test. So we're still studying the role of it in combination and uh, uh, benefit of treating gastroesophageal reflux disease. So in conclusion, I know that I've probably gave you too much technical information, but these are great and useful studies. We know so much more about your esophagus than we did um, even 10 years ago. So now we can not only tell you about the motility problems, the transition zone problems, we can tell you about all the sphincters. So when patients are uh, coming in, if they're having a negative endoscopy and not responding, you have two more tests to show them and treat them and explain. Because we all know patients, even if you tell them they have IBS or fibromyalgia, they do love that diagnosis, right? They do love to know what they have and they will look it up online, but they do wanna know from you what, what is that that they're experiencing. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, obviously esophageal manometry, uh, high resolution is definitely the way to go. That's probably the only way we recommend it at this time. Uh, if symptoms persist and the endoscopy is negative, this is definitely your test. If, so, if you're thinking of sending somebody to surgery this is mandatory. If they don't do well post-surgery, this is a great test to again figure out why they're symptomatic. If somebody's having non-cardiac chest pain, and for you cardiologists, if the patient has been in your office more than three times, probably time to refer them down, downstairs to us. Um, and more data is available, of course. Now we're, now, now we're finding more and more things that are abnormal on your, on your studies, and we still have yet to figure out how that relates to the patient, but that's coming in the next CME. So. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I